scripture reading is Titus 1, 1 through 9. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, and the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, he has brought up to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our, our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus of our Savior. The reason I left you at in Crete was that you might put it in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. A, and leader, elder, must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man who chosen, who, whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must be hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Thank you, Caleb. If you will, keep your Bibles and open Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. We'll look at that as it unfolds. As I mentioned before, if you're visiting with us, honored guests are very thankful that you're here. And like I said, you chose a good time of the year to be on the Cape. It's always a special time in the fall. One thing I want to make you aware of, we've been watching on the news, of course, that what's took place with the Bahamas as that hurricane just sat there and just devastated. Uh, the island there and I just wanted to encourage you and offer a way that you might think about helping in other ways maybe you've already done that but I want to encourage you that maybe that you have some support for the Church of Christ disaster response team they're going to work through the missionaries down there in the Bahamas and get the supplies to these missionaries and the great thing there is that they realize that they have an opportunity to share with those that they're helping. They're representing us and Christ. And, and so to be able to listen. And so if you're able to do that, let me encourage you. You can go on their website. It's fairly easy. It's churchofchristdrt.org. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we're so very thankful that you love us. We thank you to the Lord for how you continue to bless our lives. We thank you to the Lord for this precious opportunity we had to be together. And we ask the Lord, please, that you bless it. We ask the Lord that you continue to be with us as your family. We pray to the Lord as we spend this time together that truly to the Lord we encourage one another and that we lift our praise to you. We're thankful to the Lord to be called your children. And we pray, dear Lord, each day we realize how rich and wonderful blessing <coughs> that is. Lord, we are mindful of those in the Bahamas. We pray earnestly, dear Lord, that you be with them, be with them in their suffering. Come, please comfort them. We pray for our brethren there. And we pray, dear Lord, that this might be an opportunity, open door, that they can interact with people and establish relationships that lead to you. Lord, we are so very thankful for your care and love as we face the hard times of life that truly dear lord we know that you're there and if we rely upon you you will give us the strength we need lord we thank you again for all you do and we thank you to lord for this opportunity to share your word and we pray to lord that as we have a deeper understanding of your will that you will continue to guide us all things dear lord we want to give you the glory and we thank you for your mercy and grace and your spirit that indwells us we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we noted two weeks ago how vital it is to have spiritual leadership, both in our homes and in the body of Christ, which is really God's family. 
And so as a congregation, we mentioned we are moving forward on selecting elders in that process. But we also know that when we began looking at this, that the model we see for leadership in many churches in Christendom does not fit what we see in God's Word. For instance, like the Roman Catholic Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, where it has many different layers of authority. Or even the Protestant system that you see very often in many evangelical churches that flows down to the top where the local preacher is the pastor and it goes flows down from there. Because one of the things you note know when you start reading through the story of the kingdom and you start looking in the New Testament that basically after the age of the apostles, the church through the direction of the spirit and the apostles settled into a fairly simple model of leadership that is very effective and very important. Because I want to tell you something, go back to this, and that is the idea, I have seen more abuses because people have not followed the model that we see in scripture. This model basically is fairly outlined there in that opening that Paul wrote to the congregation of Philippi. Where he said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. There are three terms he uses there, I think, that help us start exploring this model. The first thing, of course, hopefully is obvious, and that is, he says, he's writing to the saints. And like I said two weeks ago, whether you believe it or not, you're all saints. Yeah. One who has overcome, one who has been sanctified by Christ, is in the kingdom. But then he addresses a term, which is really a function that some people played in the body of Christ there, and that is they were deacons. These are servants that basically fulfilled the physical needs of the body. We saw that an example in Acts chapter 6. And then we have the overseers. <coughs> referring to the eldership. And it's referred to the, as an eldership because it is a group of men. One of the things you know very clearly in scripture is, this, is that it was always a plurality. There was always more than one. And they were known by a number of terms. All are important and we're exploring all of them. Because it basically gives an idea of what it's all about. Because not only were they known as elders, but they were also known as bishops or overseers, same Greek word, but it means bishop or overseer. And then also they were the pastors. They were the shepherds of the congregation. You know, it's interesting to me, of course, as that terminology, terminology is important. Really, really is. Because more perversion is taking place because of the mixing up of terminology. You know, one of the things you know in scripture, that Paul never refers to himself as a pastor. Peter does. He says, I'm one of the elders. But Paul doesn't. Elders. These are men who could lead because of their maturity. They have grown spiritually. They've been tested, their character has developed and kestered through the years. And as I noted two weeks ago, it's a carryover basically from the Old Testament. Where it was the elders of the community that led. Another term I think is worth investigating, as we said before, and that is the evangelist, the preacher. That was the role that Timothy played. That is the role Titus played. That is the role I played. And that is the one who has proclaimed God's word. Two weeks ago, we looked at the model there in 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And we see there as that open, as Peter was writing to elders, that he put himself in that same group. He's writing to elders. He mentions these three terms, which are so very important. He said, to the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, 
and one who also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds or pastors, same Greek word, of the flock, God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, or sometimes it's translated bishops. So Peter says that the elders, as is noted in Paul's introduction to Philippi, that the elders were to be overseers. This is a compound verb that really helps us start to understand what the eldership's all about. The two parts of this verb is the one word means to watch out or look for, and the other means to have charge of. It's the ones who are charged to watch all out or look out for God's people. Those are the elders. To give attention to, to look at, to take care of, to watch with implication of hazard ahead. See, those elders in the community had the responsibility and the charge to watch out for God's people, for their eternal welfare. And there are a number of things we see in Scripture that the elders are charged to watch out for. Two weeks ago, we noticed how they are charged to watch over and facilitate the spiritual growth and service of those in the body. Paul noted there in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, To prepare God's people for works of service, so the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, and this is the objective, then we're no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. So the overseers were to help the body, those in the body, those of us in the body, to mature. To have a deep understanding of the truth and a deep understanding of how we are called to serve. Which means one who is an elder, one who is an overseer, one who is a pastor, it would go without saying that they demonstrated those attributes in their own life. That they knew the truth and know the truth. And they demonstrate it in their service, especially dealing with their interactions in the body. I mean, making time in the body and worship and service and study and fellowship a priority in their lives. How are they going to lead us if they don't do that? If they aren't showing that in their lives, it's not helping us understand in their own lives and the patterns they live. Peter also says there, 1 Peter 5, beginning verse 2, serving as overseers, not because they must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Peter noted that a central function of an overseer is what? Being an Example to the flock. Setting the pattern, setting the tone of what the Christian walk looks like. And I often think to myself, when I think of that very important aspect, that one of the primary things that they do is they set the tone. They set the tone in their service. They set the tone in their priorities. They set their tone in the simple ways. That I often think to myself, one of the questions we need to consider is, as we consider these men, is asking ourselves, if the whole congregation followed their pattern, what would the congregation look like? Because that's what we're calling them to do. We're calling them to follow the pattern. The one who is an Episcopos. Follows. 
Look at our text that Caleb read. Starting there, verse 5. Paul said, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to charge of being wild and disobedient, since an overseer is entrusted with God's work. I want you to notice verse 7 there. Because what verse 7 is really talking about, it says entrusted with God's work, that's the Greek word steward. They are the stewards of the body. A steward, of course, refers to a manager of a household and to such a person's hands is entrusted the responsibility to properly minister the affairs of the household. That's an important word here when it comes to all this we're talking about. Elders as stewards of God's household are charged to oversee God's household, making sure that God's household is run as God wants it. They are only stewards. A steward does not do his own will. A steward does not do his own desires, but he follows the will of his master and facilitates that to take place. That is the charge of the elders. That's the charge of the overseer. That the desires of the master gets done. See, an important function of an overseer, an elder, is to make sure that God's word is taught and that it is followed. Because when God has spoken, they have no authority. One who has the responsibility of safeguarding or seeing to it that something is done in a correct way, guardian. That's why, again, their life must reflect. They're not perfect, but it must reflect overall what Christian maturity looks like. Then it must reflect the standards that God has in his word. That's why those overall standards are listed every time. That the evangelists were to look for. That also means he must be one who knows, understands the truth. One who understands God's word and its application to God's people. Paul underlines this there in verse 9 of Titus. He says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. An alternative translation of the text would go this way. He must faithfully follow or hold to the message in which he can place his trust and which agrees with the doctrine that people taught him. He will help others through his good teaching and correct those who oppose the Christian doctrine. Very important function that the elders play. An elder is to watch diligently that false doctrine does not come into the body of Christ. And they must be capable of both recognizing false doctrine and being able to refute false doctrine. To refute, to scrutinize, to examine carefully, bring to light, expose, to bring a person to the point of recognizing wrongdoing convict and convince. See, not only must an elder be capable of teaching, but they must know the difference between what is true and what is false. And he must be able to refute those doctrines that are false. I mean, there are those who can teach and preach, but haven't fully come to a full grasp of what truth is. They're still struggling with it themselves. 
that's not a person that we want to lead the body of Christ. Because the elder basically is going to be questioned constantly, having things that come in their laps that they're going to have to answer and say whether this is right according to God or wrong. But, must we agree on everything? No. But we must have the fundamentals down. We must know the truth and be able to know how to defend the truth. We need to have a function of idea of how the body is to function. Because that is constant questions that come to one who leads. Because the danger to the church and the welfare of God's people depend on it. Because standing at the gate, always ready to pounce, is Satan. Standing at the gate are those false teachers, those sheep and, well, no, the wolves in sheep's cloak. Ready to attack, ready to pervert God's word. And false teachers have and can destroy the body. Remember that text, we've seen it a couple times, that text, that, that warning, that deep warning, that heartfelt warning that Paul had to the eldership. It says, keep watch over yourselves and the whole flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be pastors, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I've never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. What was he warning them? He was warning them of these wolves in sheep's clothing. He was warning them of these false teachers that would come into the body. That is why it is so very important that we do choose men that know the truth. Now, and know how to refute those who do not teach the truth. And they must be men who can stand against me or anyone else who would teach a remote false doctrine. I can tell you from my colleagues over the years how many times they've shared with me when men were appointed because they were popular, but they really didn't have a handle on the truth that congregations had been split. And too often it was hard. it came from the pulpit, and the elders did not take a stand. And so that's why those who are going to lead need to know the truth and be willing to take a stand, even against me. If I don't teach the truth, but they've got to know what the truth is, and it's so very important. But one of the things I think we need to underline when we talk about biblical leadership, both within our families and in the body of Christ, and that is the idea that it is not authority, that's not what it's about, but service. Do the elders have authority? Yes. But that's not the heart of what it's all about. I mean, if one is going to lead as an elder or deacon or evangelist in the body of Christ, it has nothing to do with honor, and it has nothing to do with glory, and it has nothing to do with authority, and it has everything to do with service. For the focus of spiritual leadership in the New Testament is not about who's top dog, 
but it's about who is going to bow to serve. That's the heart of leadership in the New Testament. People who are truly in love with God and in love with God's people. Serving why? So that more of God's people can make it whole eternally and enjoy the rich blessings of their eternal home. See, the overseer, the bishop, the pastor, the elder, and God's community, they are in fact charged with the responsibility of watching over the eternal fare of God's people. The evil writer notes, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your soul, and they're accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be to your benefit. See, go back to this. This is the model too often we see in Christendom. But this, whoops, this is the model we see in Scripture. That all of us are following Christ. And as servants of Christ, and that's exactly how Peter puts it, and as so does Paul. As servants of Christ, those who would be pastors, those who would be elders, those who would be overseers, are to facilitate and oversee Evangelists and deacons in the body of Christ. But their primary role, as is the deacons and evangelists, is to serve. <coughs> serve God's people. <coughs> to help them come to maturity, to help them understand their service in the body of Christ, and to help them understand the truth so they're not tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. To bring them, to facilitate, to oversee, to make sure as it goes along that more will make it to heaven. A group of men, spiritually mature, having a love for God and God's people. To lead, oversee, and serve God's people so those under their care might finish the race. See, the design that God has for leadership is very upside down from the world. Then in reality, go back to this. In the reality, this is too often what the world looks like. You have somebody up top and it flows down from there. And it's dealing with authority. It's dealing with honor. It's dealing with who's top dog. That's what we see in the world. And too often we're seeing duplicated in Christendom. But this is the model. This is what God designed. All of us working together for the mutual support and building up of each other playing different roles because of who we are spiritually and our maturity and bringing about that process. Because in reality, and this we need to always keep in mind, leadership in the kingdom means one must set his sights on being a slave. That's what it says in scripture. Not to be served, but to serve. You remember what Jesus said? He said it out very clearly. He said, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You hear what Jesus says. He says, you want to be first? You want to be the, the leader? Become a slave. Put everybody before you. Because see, the story of the kingdom is not about who's top dog. No. But who's willing to be a slave? Stoop down and wash feet. That's upside down, isn't it? But that is exactly what leadership in our families and in the body of Christ looks like. That in reality, when we are leading, we are serving, putting everyone's needs really before our own. To help them draw closer to God. To help them mature in Christ. To help them have a deep understanding of God's will. To help them enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. Therefore we sacrifice. And therefore we serve. The stand singer song. That night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, when he stooped down and washed feet. And when he had finished going around the room and everyone was embarrassed, when he went around the room, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, that that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do, as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. The heart of leadership is we get down and are the first to get down and do the dirty stuff. They were willing to be that person in serving the body and serving our brethren that we be, and in our families, that we be the person that gets down when we see the needs, that we're the first. You know, there's an old adage that I've always operated, that I've seen in scripture, and we can talk about it one day, but I've always had the idea that leadership in the body of Christ and leadership that God calls for is that a leader is the first one in and the last one out. 
He's there. He's the one. He's the setting the tone. And that's what God calls for. That's what he says. If we need to get in there. Why did Jesus wash their feet? Because there was a need that nobody was meeting. And he wasn't going to appoint someone to do it. He did it. <clears throat> that's what God calls for. Because in reality, we're on a journey together. All these different parts to help us mature in Christ that we can enjoy that amazing gift of being in heaven with God. We begin that journey course by believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God, willing to repent of the direction of my life that I'd lived before, being willing to confess my faith no matter what it costs, and being willing to submit myself to a watery grave where I die and it's no longer about me. It's not about who's most important. It's about serving him. If you have an invitation, invite you now as you stand and sing.